Jones, I shall need your assistance. Yes, well, at your age, I'm not surprised. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the second part of the Cinematic Sausage for this Halloween month. Well, keeping up with our last edition, I'm going to be taking a look at one of my favourite horror films. It's not horrifically horrible, it's not psychologically horrible, and in fact it's quite fun in a horrible kind of way. It stars Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee, and it's a co-production. It's not a hammer although it has so many traits of Hammer. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about the 1972 film, The Horror Express. Horror Express is one of the handful of films that I first started to watch those late nights on television in my sort of black and white portable set in my bedroom. And I became sort of addicted to watching these things that used to start at about 11 o'clock and finish about 1.30. wasn't particularly late. But one of the stables to be uh, shown quite regularly was the Horror Express. It was always a scratchy, crackly copy. And the, there was just something, though, that was quite magnetic about it. It's not the usual fare you would get for the early 1970s. There's a budget to it, and there's a little bit of handcrafting to it as well. It's made as a labour of love, and it is pure homage to the Hammer Horror. And the first thing that grabs you about this film is that haunting whistling tune at the beginning. It's something that's always got me, so it's probably playing in the background now, because the heckles are going up on the back of my neck. But there is nothing more unnerving than that echoing whistling sound that goes through the whole of the film because the characters whistle this tune and this whistling is played on several levels it's got as i said some of the characters like the baggage man whistling away whilst he's working there's that eerie eerie audio sound of the whistling emanating throughout the carriages of the train and, and nobody knowing where it's come from. In fact, people don't really take much notice of this whistling that happens throughout. But something dark is approaching. It, it's almost a fanfare of evil, but manifested itself in such an innocent way. It's quite a lovely way to start the film off. Uh, you have the rattling sound of the train, steam train coming through, races on through the camera, and what I would say is quite a shoddy, rough cut of a train. And you can even see the f film crew in the, uh, in the reflection of the snow as it hammers on by. And you're thinking to yourself, is, is this going to be a professional job or is this going to be a cheap little number? Um, quite the contrary. And then we go into the enigmatic whistling as the train's ploughing its way across the barren, cold and desolate landscape. This is the Trans-Siberian Express, and it is carrying something particularly nasty on board. But that, well, the journey hasn't quite started for all the passengers yet, so we'll soon find out about that. But that opening bit of that train coming through, it's a totally innocent train coming through, but there's something just unnerving about the whole thing. Oh yes, and it's very much a case of, there's no help, is there? You can see there's no help, it's cold and it's desolate. Nobody's coming to their assistance, should something happen on that train. So what is our... our evil threat shall we say well it's part science fiction and part horror in this case it's something that one of the explorers on board the train has found um if we go back to the very beginning christopher lee is professor sir alexander saxton and he has been carrying out some exploration of some nearby mountains close to shanghai 
And in those mountains, he's found a frozen ape person, which he believes is the last example of the missing link. So what do you do with that? Yeah, you're going to crate it up and you're going to take it back to London, aren't you? Like with all British pompous explorers, everything has to go back to London. It's not going to stay where we took it from. Hell no, we're going to go back and um, rob it there, rob from their lands. In fact, Christopher Lee is the archetypal sort of um, British explorer who has this sight who has this sense of entitlement above all foreigners, which they did in the late 1800s, early 1900s, with this sense of empire still upon people. It's called squeeze in China. The Americans don't know how. And in Britain, we call it bribery and corruption. Now, sir. Excuse me. Alexander Saxton. Yes. Captain O'Hagan, sir. General Wang told me to find you and to make myself useful. Uh, um, uh, now I remember. I do have Your Excellency's ticket. Your, your ticket, right here. But he's found something and he's crated it up and he's brought it to Shanghai Railway Station. In this case, a very busy Shanghai Railway Station. And using his influence, or in this case military influence, of getting an escort by soldiers, he manages to bully his way onto the overnight Trans-Siberian Express to make his way to Moscow, whilst en route back to Great Britain. And whilst at uh, the terminus of the railway station, we're joined by Dr. Wells, played by Peter Cushing, and his female assistant. They obviously know each other, Saxton and Wells, and there's a little bit of um, rubbing each other up the wrong way. But they also manage to get themselves onto the train through bribery and corruption more than anything else. Something that was quite affluent in those days. So, what's going on in the station? Well, the usual hustle and bustle, people running around, busy platforms, porters, and left unattended is this large crate, which is chained up taking the interest of a particular individual, well-dressed, and mixing in with the crowd. When nobody's looking, however, he decides that he's going to break into the crate and have a look inside and see if it's worth stealing. And like all good horror film audiences, we're going, for God's sake, just leave it alone and go and find something else to nick. But no, the first thing we see him do is pull aside the chains and splinter a piece of wood so he can look inside this wooden crate. So now Wells's and Saxton's little group come back out onto the platform and Cushing is more interested in what Saxton might actually have in that crate. And Saxton is basically brushing him off and saying this is something that's going to change scientific and evolutionary history as he believes he's found the missing link. But as they get to the crate, it's surrounded by a crowd and lying by the side of the crate is the thief, the well-dressed thief from earlier. Except there's something completely different about him. His eyes. They don't have any pupils. In fact, they have no colour at all. They are all completely white. And kneeling by the side of our unfortunate thief is a priest. A priest that uh, will become quite pivotal to the storyline, if you like. Can I be of any assistance, Father? This is yours. It is, but I demand an explanation. Whatever you have here is unholy and must be destroyed. Inspector Mirov, what is in there, Excellency? Fossils. In full sort of mad Rasputin style, we have Alberto de Menzola. Now, he's a very famous Spanish actor. Now, he's been in films from, ranging from 1930 up until 2010. And this is probably his best-known Western film that he's known for. Uh, when I say Western, I say mainstream English-speaking movie. But um, he's, unfortunately, he's dubbed by Robert Ratti. Um, and so we don't actually get to hear his wonderful Spanish voice. Resplendent in his dark robes and extremely long, dark beard. Very Rasputin. And his wild eyes. I mean, his acting is 
marvellous. In fact, there are a lot of characters that are shoehorned into this film that make it so exciting and vibrant because really all it is is a murder on a train. So it's not exactly Agatha Christie, but because the characters are so off the wall in some cases it, it makes it such a wonderful watch anyway he's going in the laughed rights and standing there is the train inspector and we're shortly joined by a, a police inspector plainclothes police inspector who also happens to be traveling on the train who identifies the thief he says yes i know him he's a really professional thief he can see a police officer a, a thousand yards and he said well how can he possibly see him he's blind and that quite shocks the inspector because he knows this guy. He's no way on earth is he, is he blind. But the, the police inspector is quite resolute that something odd is going on here. This is Inspector Mirov. Now, Mirov is a very experienced police officer and quite a rock-solid character throughout the film. Or rather, he is until something nasty happens to him. Now, his voice is always resonated with me as being very familiar and it was quite recently that i found out he's actually dubbed and he's dubbed by the late roger delgado and for those of you who are doctor who fans will know that roger delgado was the first master but it's such a wonderful performance by the actor sometimes it's quite reserved but there's a lot of menace within it but here on on the platform he he demands to know from professor saxton what is inside his crate and saxton says to him it's just merely samples it's merely fossils and foss, uh, fossilized body that he found within the, the m nearby mountains the crate uh, like any other baggage is put onto the baggage car which is the rear car in the train by a bunch of soldiers are assisting professor saxton we're also joined by a count and countess the countess passes her expensive jewels to the baggage man who places it in the safe which is also next door to the crate of the beast of the unknown so all things are, as you can gather are going to be happening in this last carriage and and that's the makeup of the train really you've you've got the last carriage um you've got the private carriage right at the front of the train which contains the count and the countess which is this plush opulent looking carriage sitting room piano a bedroom to one side then you have the restaurant car and then you have the night cars the sleeper cars if you like this was in fact just two sets the train they just kept redressing the sets which is a wonderful way of doing things because a carriage is a carriage it's just the contents that change so it's a wonderful way that the film has has changed around and there are rumors about that yes the carriage is from dr Zhivago, but i can see no evidence of that and that seems to have sort of come out from sort of urban legend with this anyway time and tide wait for no man the soldiers depart and so does the train out into the tundra wastes of siberia and this is where our troubles really begin what are you going to astound the scientific world with this time you'll read about it in the society's annual report it's a remarkable fossil a fossil but you've got something live in there i heard it you're mistaken you won't need to feed it then the occupant hasn't eaten in two million years that's one way to economize on food bills before they all took their seats in their carriages, Peter Cushing decided to tip the baggage man. Not because he wanted to be very generous, he just asked him to drill a hole into the crate and see what he could see inside. Uh, there's so many red flags at this point. So many red flags! Anyway, never mind. Peter Cushing finds an unexpected female guest in his room. Not that he's minded, he's a gentleman and um, he's an English gentleman. And of course he's going to help a young lady. Unbeknown to him, this young lady is a jewel thief. Yeah, we know where it's all sort of crisscrossing here, don't we? And sharing his cabin is Alexander Saxton, played by Lee, as we said earlier. So it's a bit of a crowded house now. An unexpected female guest has come to join them. And quite rightly so, being British, they cannot turn her out, if you like, into the corridor. As personal guards, we do have a couple of soldiers on board there to look after the Count and the Countess. But they're quite ineffectual, as they do in these type of films. So at this point, I, I must bring in some personal tragedy, and that in the form of Peter Cushing. Yeah, when I say personal tragedy, it was very personal for Peter. Peter, the love of his life, his wife, had tragically died, and he's still mourning. He's always, since his wife has, has died, he, and before he passed, he has always been mourning every day that 
she had there was true love between the two of them he's asked to come and do a film he's not in the best of places but i think a lot of it was to do with christopher lee saying look come on come on we'll, we'll, we'll do a film to, we'll do one more film together because cushing was getting very very disillusioned with actually carrying on his career and he thought no that's it i've had enough i've really got nothing else to work for in life so he comes onto the set on the first day and they're both in makeup christopher lee goes back out goes out and goes up to christopher i, I can't do this sorry sorry old chap uh, Beating goes and speaks to the director and says, look, I'm, I'm, I really don't want to be a thorn in your side, but I can't do this. I'm sorry, it's, I'm not in the place to be able to do this. As you can imagine, the, the director's distraught. And he goes off to, to, to Christopher Lee and says, look, Peter wants to walk. Peter, Peter can't cope with this. And, and Christopher says, don't worry, give me an hour. So Christopher, being the brilliant friend that he is to Peter, says let's go for a walk and Peter go I don't want to do this I don't want to do this I don't want to do this film nobody really knows what took place in that conversation but Christopher said something that must have resonated with Peter and brought him back onto that film set and Peter went I'm not going let's start this film so this this film man if you like really kept Peter Cushing going and it gave him the confidence to move forward and make more films so in a way this is a big milestone for Peter Cushing and, and this part of his life, especially, as I said, as tragedy was involved. And so, not really wishing to go into the storyline with such a low note, I'll throw in a little bit of a whimsical trivia here. There was a train set that they used for the model. It's quite a large model by all, by all accounts. And Peter and Christopher Lee and the director they used to play trains with it. <laughs> they used to um, go and have a, uh, a liquid dinner and then they decide to sneak up into the set uh, in the model area and then go and read, put their own bits of track out and play with this train like little boys. And you can imagine them sat there and they would sit there talking about anything, the world, anything, not, not the film, playing with this blasted train. And they would send it flying off the rails and it got damaged and they were sticking it together for most of the evening. It, it was quite fun by all accounts. Meanwhile, in the Count and Countess's carriage, the personalised mobile priest is telling them that there is evil stalking the train, uh, to which the Count takes exception to this and warns him that he'll get a damn good thrashing if he goes round saying there's evil on the train because it's frightening everybody. And he doesn't particularly like the priest, to be fair. He, he sees him as another servant, a necessity of their values, if you like. Uh, he has quite an eye for the Countess, and the Count is very much aware of this. Jesting with her immortal soul. That's why we keep you, Pujardov. Our immortal souls are your concern. <coughs> She's afraid of something. Tell me, Pujardov. Yes. Which do you think I should wear for the English one? The red or the blue? Enough. I forbid you to talk this way. You forbid? Oh, forgive me, Your Excellency. My concern for the spiritual welfare of the Countess, I forgot myself. I will pray for humility. Pray hard, Pajardov. So, meanwhile, the baggage clerk is getting his little tool out and he's making a hole to have a look inside. He removes the padlock and he makes a hole. Or rather, he does make the hole. He looks through and is quite surprised by what he sees and decides he's going to open. There's like an inspection flap. He unbolts the inspection flap. And there, in the corner of this tool crate, is a bedraggled-looking creature. We see it in the shadows, to begin with, but we just see its face. Uh, a living fossil, if you like. And as he's looking in, one of the eyes of this living fossil starts to glow red. And a horrible humming sound starts. And then you get the shot of the baggage handler in and out of focus. And every time it's in and out of focus, its eyes are beginning to bleed. 
and bleed profusely till eventually his eyes are completely white and he collapses to the ground. The creature leans out its hand, or rather its hairy hand, reaches out and rips off the padlock. It's free. It's about to go roaming and it's very interested in the people of this planet. was in there? I told you, a fossil, part ape, part man. It lived two million years ago. Are you telling me that an ape that lived two million years ago got out of that crate, killed the baggage man and put him in there, then locked everything up neat and tidy and got away? Yes, I am. It's alive. It must be. Lock him up. We'll search the train and find it, whatever it is, and destroy it. But if it's alive... I want this kept quiet. I don't want to panic the passengers. And so we have, here we have the base under siege, the isolated group of explorers, uh, the outback wilderness monsters attacking. It's the old cliche, and it's very much from the, um, the book Who Goes There. And we know, spawning from that book, we had Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and more importantly, we had the 1951 film The Thing from Another World. Start warning everybody else in the camp. Does that speaker system work from here? Yes, it's which on the left going to overload Attention everybody in camp. Stay where you are and bolt your doors. Our visitor has returned and is dangerous. Stay where you are until notified and bolt your doors. Stay where you are. And this is what this very much is. It's something that's been found in the ice, in this case in the mountains, and it's come back to life. And it's not very happy. The background of this creature is it came to Earth millions of years ago with some of its comrades in a spaceship. They're from outer space. It's not a hairy man, by the way. The creatures are... Um, I'll explain why it's hairy and why it's Neanderthalish to begin with. It's, um, it absorbs itself into... It has the ability to absorb itself into other creatures and take over their being. It basically absorbs their thoughts... So therefore, it can evolve and assimilate the information. It's the Borg. If you watch Star Trek, it's the Borg, basically. They travel everywhere. They assimilate. Unfortunately, he can't assimilate with anyone of his own kind because they buggered off and left him behind. So can you imagine that they're on the flying saucer and said, seen George today? No, he must be downstairs. Well, I haven't seen him for a couple of light years. Oh, well, oh bugger, we've left him on Earth. Well, I'm not going back. Do you know, we're halfway home now. I'm not turning around. He can stay there. And that's basically what's happened. This poor old alien creature has been left behind during the time of the dinosaurs. So he's evolved by absorbing himself into creatures that have a high survival rate and through that he's acquired knowledge and now he's unfortunately been embedded in this so he's probably doing so well wasn't he thinking right okay at some point they're going to invent the rocket and i can go home oh bugger here comes the ice age Mirov discovers that the baggage attendant is missing and the door is wide open in the rear baggage car, so he presumes the worst. He also gets Saxton gunpoint rather than willingly to open the crate to see what's inside. Saxton throws the keys out of the window so he can't open the lock, which is a pretty futile thing to do because they, they basically bust the lock open and then crack open the crate with an axe to discover the body of the baggage clerk with his eyes all white. They're concerned now that the creature might be roaming the train, but it is pointed out to them nobody has passed the guard in the corridor and there is nobody in the baggage car and the door is wide open. So they presume, wrongly of course, that the creature has jumped off the train out of pure fear of not knowing what a train is and trying to escape. So they presume the terror is over. But alas, it's only just beginning. With Professor Saxton now under house arrest, or rather cabin arrest, Mirov takes charge of what's going on. He has a guard standing outside the baggage container, just in case of would-be morbid curiosity seekers, inside the baggage carriage carrying out an autopsy on the dead baggage man. They remove the top of his head and find a very, very smooth, to describe in their words, smoother than the baby's bottom, brain. No indentations, no anything to indicate that it is a brain. It is just a pink mass. It's urgent. What are the symptoms? He's dead. You saw him. Oh, that one. There's nothing I can do for him. Now there's one more dead. One of my soldiers. The same white eyes. I want to know the cause of death. Who's dead? 
Keep your nose out of it. You didn't hear anything. Excuse me. Is Professor Sexton's fossil still at large? I think the fossil or whatever it is escaped. Jumped off the train. Miss Jones, I shall need your assistance. Yes, well, at your age, I'm not surprised. Their assumption is that this creature has a way of absorbing a person's brain cells, if you like, and retaining them whilst wiping them completely from the human being. Thus, they can't function and they drop dead. Thinking the creature is still not there, they cover the body over and they return to their carriages to wash up. And at this point, any seasoned viewer of any kind of horror film will tell you it hasn't gone away. It's not going to finish that quickly. So the creature then clambers back inside to the train carriage, disturbing the jewel thief as she's come in to break in and take the Countess's jewels. She too is absorbed into the memory status of the creature, only to be disturbed by Peter Cushing who comes in and finds the creature. The creature turns on him, grabbing his arm, but Miroff intervenes and starts putting bullets into the creature. Cushing hits the deck, basically. He doesn't want to get shot, doesn't want to get absorbed. Don't blame him, really. However, something peculiar is happening to Miroff. His eyes are slightly bleeding, but the creature is, is dying slowly. It's slumped against a crate, and its red eye starts to, starts to just basically fade, and the life force disappears from the creature. Miroff staggers off down the corridor. Miroff collapses and isn't put in one of the cabins, but as you and I can guess by now, he has been absorbed by the creature, and this is emphasised to the audience by his left arm being extremely hairy, and basically the representation of the creature's left arm. The absorption process wasn't complete. The creature died before the complete absorption of Miroff took place, so therefore part of the hairy creatures part of him still so that can't be helped he has basically to wander around the train now with his hand in his pocket now having carte blanche to wander the entire train the creature inside miroff's body finds out who exactly his passengers are he finds out there's an engineer on board he also finds out that the count has this marvelous piece of metal on board him with him that he's taking to moscow that can absorb great heat so the creature is hatching his plan, and one by one, you know where we're heading with this lot. They're all going to be done in, and their memories are going to be absorbed into the being of the creature. However, before that is going to happen, he's going to have to take care of any communications on the train. He gets to the wireless telegraph room where the train inspector is sat, and he eliminates the train inspector. However, unbeknown to him, an emergency message has been sent to the nearest station. I know about telegraphs, little papa. I know about trains. I know about electrical currents. On your feet, everybody! Outside, full pack! Even though I still believe in God, I don't like to be made a fool of. No, Your Honor. I wouldn't do that. Tell me, little father. You believe in the devil? Yes, Your Honor. Oh, good. Send a telegram. Tell him that Captain Kazan, he knows that a horse has four legs. He knows that a murderer has two arms. But still, the devil must be afraid of one honest Cossack. Hmm? And just as you think things are becoming mundane and boring and it's just going to be death by numbers, Telly Savalas turns up. He's a Cossack. In fact, he's in charge of a little group of Cossacks. He's Captain Kanzan and he's in charge of a group of Cossacks waiting at the next railway station. And to say his performance is slightly eccentric would be an understatement. That man, he's the one who wouldn't let us get off the train. He's responsible. Your Excellency, I'm a police inspector. Everybody's under arrest! In 
including you. Who are the killers? Who? Who are the troublemakers? <laughs> who are the foreign influences? Ah. A little bit of context needs to be put in here. Savalas took the part, read the script and said, this is a bit weak for me, if you don't mind. Do you mind if I ad lib a bit? And they went, yeah, what the hell, go on, ad lib. So you have this eccentric, alcoholic captain who decides to take over the train and behave in quite a bizarre manner. Uh, which doesn't really get him anywhere with him and his Cossacks, because he's not really going to defeat the creature, is he, through um, bluster, eccentricity, and complete and other bonkers. Mirov is slowly having his authority taken away from him by this mad Cossack, but there's somebody who's been watching Mirov, somebody who's very unsure about him, and that's the priest. Cornering Mirov in part of the train, he says he wants to believe in him because he believes he's the actual manifestation of the devil. Mirov tells him to go away, but the priest basically says, I want to believe in you now. You have so much, so much divine power. I want to believe in you, thinking that he was ultimate evil. So when Mirov is exposed by Cushing and Lee, he's unceremoniously executed by Savalis. And he has time then to be absorbed into the priest. And with the eccentricities also the priest and his manic devotion to wanting to believe in something, and in this case, it's pure evil, his powers are amazingly strong. So much so that he walks into the carriage and he eliminates all the Cossacks, causing everybody else to take flight to the carriages at the rear of the train. With the Count dead... He has the metal. He has absorbed one of the passenger's brains, who's also uh, an engineer. So he now has the ability to make the metals to create a spaceship to escape from the Earth. What he needs to do now is get somewhere as soon as possible. So he makes his way to the front of the train, boards the engine and takes control of the engine, ramping the speed up, sending the train hurtling out of control. He's like a madman possessed. Meanwhile... Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee are getting ready to mount a counter-attack. That's not possible. It is possible. I will teach you to end disease, pain, hunger. Wait. There's something more. Things are dire. The creature has basically said to Christopher Lee, let me go. Christopher Lee says, I can't possibly do that and let you wreak havoc around the world. And he says, all I want to do is go home. Christopher Lee levels his hunting rifle at him. However, the creature isn't going to give up that easily. And through the power of will, brings back those Cossacks who he's killed. And they're now going to fight for him. One of the most interesting and possibly quite most uncomfortable process is having the makeup put on for the eyes uh, for the creatures when you you suck out you know all the color in their eyes so that you have to bear in mind this is 1970s and prosthetics aren't that good especially in, in a, a film of this type that it looks very convincing however it also looks exceptionally painful for the actor to have to wear and one of the things that the the actors did say is once they had the white shells put in across their eyes and some fake fake skin put in around the outside they were completely blind so when we come to the point where the dead cossacks are manifested back to life a la zombie style you do you see them wandering into each other inside the the railway carriage and that that's not not because that they're acting blind they are actually blind poor old telly savalis has got what looks like some kind of stick that he's holding himself up by and then he's finding his way around a r- the room which isn't very well lit because it's supposed to be a dark unlit carriage so it's not the safest of places to have been around bearing in mind at some point they're about to have fights with sabers in a moment which is going to be quite dangerous Now, you can probably tell by the pitch of my voice, because it's got excitable, that things are about to get very, very action-packed. Well, Telly Savalis is there, and there's a load of zombie killer Cossacks. How couldn't it get exciting? So, do you want to know what happens in the end? I'm not going to tell you. 
I think you should go and seek it out for yourself because if you've enjoyed my babblings about this film, go and look for it yourself. It's available on so many platforms. You can go and get the DVD. Um, there's a Blu-ray version, which I've got now, which makes it look a wonderfully sumptuous film. Or it is available on YouTube. So seek it out. You won't be disappointed. As I said, it's not horrifically horrible. It's not psychologically horrible. It's horrible in a fun way. And horror sometimes needs to be fun. That was part two of our Halloween cinematic sausage. My name has been Warren H. Cummings, and I was joined for part one by Paul Chandler as we took a look at Eyeball. And if you haven't seen that, why not you pick that one up and cast an eye over it? And in the second part, I've been taking a look at The Horror Express, starring Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. So if you've enjoyed yourself, please join us again and pass the word. If you want to drop me a line, you can contact me via our Twitter feed. So good luck, and I'll see you again next time. Take care now, and thanks for listening.